Well, hello, fellow Wargamers and history buffs, and welcome to our very first uh, tactical talk, or we'll have to come up with some title for it. Um, and joining me today is my friend Brennan Close. Um, Brennan, why don't you tell everybody out there in the universe a little bit about yourself and your connection to La Bataille? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brennan Close. I'm based in Washington, D.C., but I've uh, worked a lot all over the world over the years. Um, when I was a child, my father was a reporter for the Washington Post newspaper. And when I was eight years old, uh, he and our family were posted to Moscow, Russia in 1977 um, for four years. My dad was the Washington Post bureau chief in Moscow for those four years. And um, I was eight years old when, when we arrived. And very shortly after we arrived, along came my ninth birthday. And my parents said, well, gee, you know, uh, maybe we should find something fun and interesting to do for your ninth birthday. And we've read about a giant battlefield outside Moscow where this famous character, Napoleon, who tried to conquer the world, had a big battle um, back in the 1800s. So for my ninth birthday party, my parents drove me and my friends out to the battlefield of Borodino. And uh, we held my ninth birthday party <laughs> in the village of Borodino, which is right wow. there next to the Ryevsky Redoubt. And so, you know, we started the visit next to the church tower in this little village. It's extremely well preserved. It's a national historical park there. Right. Um, and then, then we walked from the village of Borodino across the Kalachow stream and up, um, up the grassy slope to the Ryevsky Redoubt. Um, which is, uh, at, they had just restored it. Uh, I was going through archaeological restoration. And so it was this grassy field with uh, a row of grassy ramparts with the, you know, the embrasures for the guns. And there was a, an old Russian gentleman there who was part of the archaeology team who was digging with a shovel in the Ryevsky Redoubt right there as we walked up. And, and as we walked up, the shovel hit something down in the grass. And he reached down and picked up a handful of dirt that he brushed away and opened his palm and, and showed it to me. And in his hand was a musket ball. Oh, wow. From 1812. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, so then he went over to the little museum that's there. And, and on the other side of, of the hill, you can see the fleshes. They had, they, they were sort of subsided since then. They've, they've rebuilt them. But when I was nine years old, this made an incredible lasting impression on me about. I would history. imagine. Yeah. And then um, later on in the, in the 1970s and 80s, I began playing historical war games as a hobby. Uh, we'd come back to the States by that point. And then, um, uh, but we always wanted to find a really interesting Napoleonic series to play because of those early experiences and because of, you know, where Nap Napoleon and Napoleonic history fits in, uh, in world history. And in about 1987, we found um, the Clash of Arms La Bataille series. And it had all these formations, column formation, line formation, infantry, cavalry, artillery, um, and authentic maps and beautiful covers and pictures. So we went out to our local game shop, which was called Dream Wizards at the time on the outskirts of Washington, and started buying the series. The first, the first game that uh, my brother and I got uh, was uh, Talavera. Okay. Uh, and then we just rolled forward with the series from there. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I, that's a um, I've been playing it since there, I guess, 84 or so when uh, Auerstadt came out. And uh, then I played Talavera, got that. But yeah, it's a terrific series. Um, uh, you've played other Napoleonic game series then? Or has this been your um, primary? Lots of different ones. Uh, there are, there's different scales, right? There's a, um, a really interesting one. I mean, the, the first... Napoleonic type game that many people played back then uh, was Waterloo from Avalon Hill. Right. And that had a very accurate, interesting operational level map. And it had a good series of pieces that accurately represented the armies, but the tactics and the, and the game mechanics were very clunky and old fashioned. And you couldn't do 
a line or a column and you couldn't see the interaction of artillery and infantry. So the game was neat, but it was never enough. Right. Yeah, I think uh, that's a common common complaint, but good start for a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly drew you into the topic. And then, so with that Avalon Hill game and then lots of historical reading, just as because one of, of course, all of our, as game, war gamers, you know, often main interest is world history and military history. So by reading all that in the in the background, you know, you start to wonder, well, what more can I learn? How can we get more granular um, detail and, and turn it into a real lived experience or a recreation of the history so you can see what might have happened? Um, and uh, other games that I have played and enjoyed at the in the Napoleonic period are uh, there's Napoleon at Leipzig, which is a mid-level, brigade-level uh, game. And then a really interesting one is Struggle of Nations, also an Avalon Hill Kevin right. Tucker game. That has the, the sweep of the campaigns and the long marches with the very rare but very aggressive battles. When they... Cool. Yep, I've, I've played those back in the day as well. <laughs> they make for a really great uh, combination of you know sources to um, connect into your own picture and, and interest in, in the field. And then of course, there are lots of very interesting and useful uh, reading sources to th that help bring the Napoleonic period to life. Um, War and Peace, obviously, with these amazingly detailed uh, battle scenes and, and human stories. Um, the Face of Battle by John Keegan, which says this was written in the in about 1976 it's a, a classic of military history he was one of the first historians to say you know what we've done enough of reading about generals and armies let's go down to the soldiers level and try to describe the experience of soldiers on the field and he has uh, agincourt and waterloo and the somme in that book but the the whole section midsection on waterloo has incredible detail of what it was like to be at the field of waterloo yeah, and and I know that there's been more emphasis in uh, in history to get down to the level of the soldiers and their spouses and you know uh, people that were um, you know adjacent to the battlefield, <laughs> you know, and so it it adds a lot more depth to the uh, overall um, history um, than as you said the upper level with what the aristocrats and the generals are doing. So. so if you take that type of history, plus a broad, a broad interest, and then you bring it to the Labatai war games, it becomes a really cinematic experience. You know, there's always a fair amount of learning the rules for the first bunch of time you play it. Uh, Labatai's rules, once you know them, they flow. And right. all the different rules versions from second edition, third edition, uh, premier, fifth edition, regulations of the year 30, they all flow pretty right. much the same, but it, but it does take a while to really get them. Um, right. And then once you get them and get the flow, then you get the mechanics and then you start to ask yourself and, you know, my, my brother and uncles and friends and I have been playing these since 1987 or whatever, uh, started to ask ourselves, well, how can we come up with tactics that A, help you win the game and B, have historical authenticity or what can you learn from the history books and how would you, what would that look like if it was done in the game? Uh, and we've sort of just built up a real, I don't know, arsenal or knowledge base of mm -hmm. things that people in our group like to do and enjoy doing in the Labatai games because we've seen that uh, A, they help you win in the game, uh, B, they, they just work efficiently and effectively, and, and C, they have some very interesting historical authenticity, and they contribute to the learning and understanding of history. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I like about the scale of the La Bataille system and the rules, doesn't matter which rule set you use, you really get a good sense of that interplay and the combined arms tactics that are so clear in this particular era of combat. Um, and so then that kind of launches us into our combined arm tactics. <laughs> so one of the things that, uh, so Brennan and I met, uh, gosh, last fall at uh, Tempe, um, you were playing the uh, Heilsberg game, playtesting that with the Marshall guys. I was doing um, the uh, fifth edition uh, 
Mont Saint Jean um, Mark II with a couple of new players, and you were popping back and forth uh, between those two games from time to time, and uh, had a chance to to chat with you a little bit, and then we communicated more, mm -hmm. and then of course we had a chance to play side by side at uh, the Buckeye Game Fest there in April, um, and get to know each other a little bit more, and particularly talking about a way that we could try to impart um, some more knowledge to folks. Uh, you know, one of the frequent complaints I get through the YouTube, you know, comments or things on ConSim or Facebook is the rules are complicated or they are intimidating. And so one of our ideas here by having this series of discussions with Brendan and I is to help people, particularly if they're playing Lava Tie, be able to do it more effectively, enjoy the game more. Um, but a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about, you can take it over to other games that uh, might have a similar scale. So the Vive Lamper series games are uh, regimental scale, but you still have line, column, and square, and skirmish. So some of these different things that we're talking about still have applications to a game like that. Um, there's some new battalion-level games that are coming out. Um, I had interviewed uh, my, Mark Hinkle uh, from New England Games Simulation. He's coming out with a new battalion-level ALAO uh, later this year, and there are some other ones that are in the works. So what we're talking about, why it may focus, and we might be looking at, you know, maps and pieces that are Lava Thai, folks should be able to use these concepts and ideas to in other game settings, um, uh, no matter what, uh, no matter what you're going to be doing. So uh, let's see here. I will greet our various and sundry folks that have signed in so far. So we've got Mitch, we've got Texigander, we've got Meandering Mike. Hello, William. Uh, from beautiful Kitchener, Ontario. <laughs> uh, let's see, we've got, uh, uh, that's that's it so far. Anybody else who's there? Um, if you are watching this and you have questions, by all means, put questions in the um, uh, comment section. Uh, so that way, as we're going along, we can answer your questions. Um, or, and I'll be kind of keeping an eye out on that. Um, oh, Meandering Mike is asking, when did Labatai de Heilsberg release to the public? That was released last October. So October of 2022. Um, they still have copies available for sale. So you can go to the labatai.me website um, if you wanted to order a, a copy of the game. Um, and then I know that they're starting to work on a new project. Uh, I am not at liberty yet to share the name of that particular battle. Um, but I'll probably be playtesting that here a little later in the summer. Um, and that one will uh, won't release in the fall, but most likely will release next spring or uh, fall of 2024. Let's see. We got Joe Blow here with us, too. Hello, Joe. <laughs> yeah, All right. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, good. So, um, uh, Brennan, how do you want to handle things here? Uh, getting started with our uh, presentation here on... Game tactics for Labatai. We want we wanted to talk about combined arms. Um, so why don't you kind of set that up for us before we move into the slides? Yeah. Well, as we get started, obviously one of the first things that I'd like to do is just say a huge thank you to all the people at Marshall Enterprises and Clash of Arms um, who have put this series together, who've stuck with it through all the years, who've put such amazing labors of love into the games themselves, the research, the maps, the artwork, the counters, you know, uh, all the associated um, glory that the series has in it. Uh, and uh, it's certainly been really fun and meaningful getting to know, um, you know, Monty Matson and Jim Soto and Dennis Spores and Ed Wimble and everybody um, over the last several months. Um, and it's also been really fun plugging into the community that the online world has made possible. Eric, looking at, at all of your wonderful material and playing with people, um, it's been really fun. So um, it's it's a neat community and there's this incredible resource of deeply researched and beautifully produced games that we can all use to learn uh, the history and, and have enjoyment just playing again. Um, uh, we have put out on Facebook and on Consim World the first version of uh, sort of a tactics guide, which we're calling Game Tactics for La Bataille. Um, 
the idea is to almost make it an open source public domain kind of thing where people can bring their best ideas and we can add them in as people have good ideas. What you see in that uh, tactics guide and also in the conversation, right, none of it makes any claims to be uh, you know, definitive or the best or any, any, or even historical. These are just ideas and thoughts that we have seen in our group over the years have worked really well. I mean, we, we do have a feeling that a lot of these approaches work really well, uh, but that doesn't mean it's the be all and end all. So uh, it will be very interesting to build a community discussion around how to go about, you know, uh, doing things that help win games and that match history. Uh, when you think about Napoleonic warfare from a historical point of view, one of the very first things that comes to mind is combined arms and how to use the infantry and cavalry and artillery on, on the battlefield. So, so we thought that was obviously the, um, the place to start, the, the coolest place to start would be with a, a dis discussion of combined arms. So that's what tonight's conversation is about. Let's move to the next slide. Sure. So Meandering Mike asks, uh, basically says, Tactics Guide, ooh, take my money now. Um, Mike, the, the guide is free, um, and I will put a link in the, um, in the comment area below this video for where you can go and find it. Um, but so far, we've posted it. There is a La Bataille Facebook group, um, and there's also then a, um, uh, on Consim World uh, Forum, there's a forum for the Labatai games, and we've got something posted there too. Um, and then probably over time, uh, I'll try to upload some stuff to um, Board Game Geek, because uh, I know a lot of people go to that as well. So we'll try to have uh, as many different places where people can find it. Um, but after this is, uh, after we do this broadcast, I'll put something down in the uh, in the comment area. Um, so that way people can find at least a link to uh, one of the easier ones to, to get a hold of. So uh, let's see. Mitch is asking here, at the appropriate time, can you discuss the logic behind rule? <laughs> All right. Um, we're not going to get into the rules necessarily today, uh, but that's certainly a great, um, a, a great comment to have. And we certainly look forward to you guys putting comments in the videos like, hey, could you cover this? Can you talk about this? A guide to, you know, this particular rule system or a, um, you know, a sequence, you know, I, I've done some sequence of play cards um, out there, but, you know, we're, we're, I'm happy to try to, whenever I have time, put together some stuff. So please, um, you know, if you have questions or whatnot, um, put those in the comments for the video and then we can uh, try to address those at a future point in time. I'm not prepared to answer questions on specific rules, particularly regs at this particular moment, uh, but that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So Meandering Mike says, I don't usually use Consim. I might have to meander over there. Yes, indeed, Mike, uh, live up to your namesake there and meander over. It's a, it's a pretty, good, uh, pretty good spot. So, uh-oh. Here we go. We have none other than Mr. Robert Bond. Rules. Hire the lawyers, indeed. Well, we are going to try to avoid rule lawyers. Those are, uh, uh, I'm sure Brennan and I can share some stories about that. <laughs> so, all right. So let's go on to the next slide here. And hopefully everyone can see this. So in the tactics guide, uh, we try to take a pretty systematic approach to uh, walking through Labatai topics. Eric, let's slide over to the left side and just do a quick run down the, um, the table of contents. Oh, there. okay. Give me a second yeah. here. Just, just you slide. There you go. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, the idea with the, with the game tactics guide is to start at the top level and just kind of do some scene setting and, and uh, systematic layout of some principles and concepts from Napoleonic warfare and from war games, um, then to uh, to look at some very specific examples of things you can do, give, give a quick idea of a fun and effective, uh, fast moving way to just jump in the game and have tactics that begin to work. Uh, and then there's also a historical uh, commentary about the actual French uh, combined arms methods and what that looks like. So that's in the first section. And then later on in the guide, we're going to work through infantry, cavalry, artillery, different troop types, 
army level maneuvers, you know, with big arrows around the map to have them in first position and explore different places. Lots of fun uh, and lots of space for people to bring good ideas and add over time. Um, but uh, today we want to focus on combined arms. So combined arms is part of creating combat power for your forces. Combat power is really, it's a concept that's the ability to do damage to the enemy in terms of hits, morale checks, uh, delaying them, causing confusion. So that's creating combat power is really a good way of thinking about tactics, how to win at Labatai. Well, you want to create strong combat power. Uh, and then a really good way to create strong combat power is combined arms. It's a really good way in the game and it's also very historical. Historically, that's what the marshals and generals and, and Napoleon himself were trying to do was to come up with combined arms combination that would multiply the uh, unit's individual powers and create something that would be unstoppable. And we wanna look at how to do that on the battlefield. There are some other really useful and important concepts in the tactics guide that we'll just mention briefly here at the start. One is concentration of force. This is a really well-known military concept and it basically says, uh, if you're gonna fight, fight with everything you have or don't fight at all. So in La Bataille terms, what that means is on a battlefield, um, you don't have to go fighting everywhere, but where you do decide to hold the fight, make sure you've got as much power as you can get into, into one place. So you're gonna win in that area where you're going to fight. Uh, and then another really important and useful concept in general, and it's a military thing, but it's also uh, um, a La Bataille thing is mutual support which is making sure that your units are close enough to each other so they can help each other out naturally and easily and not be scattered all over the map. Like it may look exciting to send your Cossacks raiding three miles deep into the enemy rear, but that's not always the best way to do it because they can get isolated or have little impact. Whereas if they're close enough to help each other, then uh, you get much more impact in the game. And combined arms, creates concentration of force and uses mutual support. Because we wanted to mention those topics. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. Here we go. So I thought it would be fun to bring up from history a really totally authentic historical diagram of combined arms. So um, in the Napoleonic period, these armies, when they fought well, they succeeded at bringing their infantry and their cavalry and their artillery together to work together in an integrated way. Um, combined arms has been a really notable concept in, uh, in Napoleonic warfare. And the classic thing it means in La Bataille game terms is using, a, a classic example of it is using your cavalry to scare the opposing infantry into squares and then you bring up your own infantry and artillery and destroy the squares by firepower. That's like the, the first place to start with combined arms. Um, the first example of it. But um, so the question is, what do you do with an army? How do you deploy it? What formation does it take? And how does it act turn after turn in the game or hour after hour on the battlefield to produce that constant mutual support and multiplying effect of the different capabilities of the different units? And this is a historical example from uh, George Nafziger's Imperial Bayonets. Um, he has a whole chapter on combined arms. Um, and uh, we pulled up his diagram there showing from 1812, the Prussian um, layout of uh, how a corps or this is brigade scale, how a Prussian brigade would form itself up on the battlefield uh, and roll forward into the attack to achieve combined arms. And what you see is, um, uh, Eric, can you zoom in some on the diagram itself? Absolutely. There we go. So you can see that it's, um, you know, formirung zur attack. So it, this is the formation to launch an attack. And you can see up at the front is the skirmish screen. And then there's a checkerboard of battalions in column. And you will notice that in this Prussian approach from 1812, the battalions are not in line in the body of the brigade, they're in column. And they're in a checkerboard here with um, battalions 
um, with intervals to them. And there was a historical, and there's a game reason for the intervals. One of the big reasons is when the skirmishers route away, they get, you know, uh, approached by cavalry or they lose the fight or, and they have, or so, some other infantry unit has to run away. You don't want them running through your game units because that's extra morale checks and sooner or later you route along with the runners. Uh, so they, it's a very historical that they would have intervals between the battalions and the intervals would be wide enough so that, that those battalions and column, when they needed to, they could move into a line for firepower. But that wasn't their standard formation. They would maneuver the brigade in this type of formation, which of course in the Labatai game leaves you in column, which is a higher movement allowance than in line. And then back behind, you have the artillery uh, and you have cavalry in pretty close support. And the cavalry left and right here. Um, can well, and center, left, right, and center. Left, right, and center, exactly. Yeah. Um, it can protect the artillery first and foremost. Its job is to escort the artillery and prevent um, uh, prevent the opposing cavalry from coming in and chewing up your, your artillery batteries. And then the cavalry is fast enough and mobile enough that when it needs to, it can uh, aggressively move forward and charge the enemy. It can either go through the intervals or it can go around on the outsides of the... So right, and this was one of the major innovations of the French system, um, as opposed to if we think about the sort of linear system from Frederick the Great and the Seven Years' War, where the cavalry is all out on one end or on both flanks, um, having some cavalry behind the infantry line, having this intermesh between the artillery, the infantry, and the cavalry, um, this is what makes Napoleon... Um, you know, until everyone figures out what the heck he's doing, <laughs> this is a key to his success early on in his campaigns. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's that intermesh. Exactly. And when you use it in the Labatai game, it works really, really well. Let's let's move over to the right and, uh, and maybe you can zoom out and we'll just look at the general part. So it's that skirmish screen in front. It's the checkerboard of the battalions in column as the main body. And then the artillery, the artillery, they've got the, the foot batteries up front. But in game terms, it actually works best to have the artillery deep in the formation in game terms for protection. The artillery right. has good, good range in the game. So you, you generally actually don't want your artillery up front. You want it kind of back behind a curtain. Um, and then there's a historical commentary from Nafziger here, which just basically said that this combined arms approach, as you said, Eric, uh, was the ultimate weapon of, of the time because of the intermesh and the um, uh, force multiplication. So this is a cool historical diagram. Now let's go to the next slide. See how it and looks in uh, actual game, yeah. This is what it looks like in the game. So now on the right side, you can see a game arrangement of, this is a French division in formation. It's from the Heilsberg game, but you can use, it works almost any game. Uh, and you can see the skirmish screen in front with two Leger battalions out there. Uh, it has a checkerboard of battalion columns. It has the artillery in the back and um, the cavalry on the wings. Now, one noticeable difference in the game implementation of this combined arm formation from real life is instead of having a pure checkerboard, for the best game implementation, you actually want the infantry battalions in that checkerboard, one behind the other, in order to create the straight hex rows for the cavalry to charge through and get up its momentum for the multiplier, for the melee multiplier. Right, so instead of having them alternating uh, like, like bricks in a wall, um, you need to have a gap then so that they can basically do their charge through that space. That's right. And yeah. so the game implementation is slightly different, but it's based on the historical concept and it works really well. It basically, you know, real life is a lot more flexible than a game on um, hex grid. So what you can see here is that the Hussars and then the little Chasser, you know, over to the left are lined up and they're ready to drive out through those intervals. They can, I, if there's an incoming cavalry charge, they can reaction charge to protect their own units. Or if uh, if this group is on the attack, then it can drive forward. They can make a charge from back there very effectively. Another thing to look at: um, many of the Labatai rules editions, the uh, Regs 30 and Fifth Edition, and others, they use command rules. Um, and so the question is: Is it even possible to use this type of combined arms formation while using the command rules? And the answer is, 
Um, very definitely, yes. Uh, so this arrangement here actually is set up with all the units in command. So the infantry general is set up in the center of his division, the infantry division commander, and it's he has a three hex command range. So all of these battalions would be in command. And the skirmishers are in contact with their battalion. So they have, there's a minor extension by contact. Um, right. But everybody's always in command. Uh, and then the, the division commander is in command from the corps commander who's using his strong artillery bonus to help the artillery for combat, but he can pass command up to the division commander and receive it from the army general. So a combined arms approach of this nature works perfectly well in, um, in a command system. There's a, there's a question over on the right, which is in La Bataille, can artillery fire over friendly infantry? The answer is no generally no. Uh, and so in this formation, you would slide the artillery out and it would fire through one of the channels. So you can use those, you can use those intervals to send artillery firepower out at the enemy or to send a cavalry charge or for your own um, units to disorder and route back through. Right. And you have to imagine that obviously, oh, I have a hiccup here. Um, you have to imagine that can you hear me? I can hear you. This one. Okay. Yeah, there, there's just a little bit of freezing here. Um, but you're going to have maybe another division next to you. So you could have the artillery in that gap between the two divisions um, supporting the two divisions as well. That's exactly so, right. And that's exactly what we're going to look like. So we've now looked at, uh, if you can zoom back out. Yeah, give me a second. The system's kind of running a little laggier. Sure. So... Let me go ahead and hmm. all right. Let's see, give it a second here. I've got the little thing turning around. I might have to stop the screen share for a second. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I think things are hopefully moving a little bit better. I had to close out of the PowerPoint. It was acting up. Hey, can folks let me know how the, are you able to hear things, see things? Do we have some technical issues with the live stream? Um, make some notes in the comment. That will let me know. I'm showing that we're still live, but it, it didn't. It did not like. <laughs> it did not like what I was doing with the. Hear and see. Okay, sound and video is fine. All right, thanks guys. All right, let me go ahead. So Brendan, I'm going to have to reopen the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint slide. So give me a second here. Jeremy Harris said, uh, is interested in uh, the cavalry part. That's cool because we're going to get into cavalry um, uh, throughout the rest of the discussion with some examples of. So you just saw where to put the cavalry, which is in the early formation as it, you make the approach towards the enemy and on the attack. The cavalry is medium, it's rear or mid rear. It's so mobile, it can move forward when it needs to. All right. Well, give me a second here. See if I can get this to cooperate with me. It's like anything else. Technology has its ups and downs. So, <laughs> you know, as, as we looked at the history books and the wonderful games and started to think about, you know, how do you actually try to implement in the game some of the concepts or specific approaches from history, it was really fun to just get the counters out and do some reading, you know, read John Keegan or read um, uh, John Elting's Swords Around the Throne, and you read in there lots of detail about Napoleon's empire and all the logistics and everything. Then, you, then they get to the battlefield. Like, okay, 
okay, so how did the army deploy? Well, if you read Swords Around a Throne or other places, you can see historians talking about a checkerboard of battalion columns at you know, uh, at deployment intervals. Well, what does that look like in the game? We just saw exactly what that looks like. Uh, and then, then you start to use it in the game. You say, hey, this really works, but we have to slide off the checkerboard and create those channels for the artillery to fire through and the cavalry to move through. All right. Give me a second. One last attempt here to open it up. I think I had two PowerPoints running. The first one and then the one that we were trying to uh, update. So that might have been why it crashed. So. There's a question there from uh, Andy Irish about uh, how is elevation considered in Labada? Labada has a perfectly feasible, reasonable, approximate elevation system. It uses slopes and uh, woods and villages and stuff. And there's a line of sight, um, which is reasonably appropriate um, for for the period. And then there's a question about um, in Labadine historically, you know, did artillery fire over the heads of its own troops? If you read a bunch of the history or talk to the designers like Ed Wimble and people, they'll tell you that by and large in the Napoleonic period, the artillery often did not fire over the over its own troops. Like it physically could, but um, uh, it, it often didn't because the cannons would fire flaming wads and all kinds of nasty would go flying out. And the infantry and cavalry really didn't like that stuff going over their heads. So if, if you read a lot of the history, you'll see generally the artillery really not being in place to fire over. It's not not exclusively so, but by and large in the field. That was yeah. yeah, particularly I was reading Elting's Sword Around the Throne recently and, and he was commenting on the firing in three ranks for the infantry. And the poor guys in the first rank who are kneeling, they got all this, you know, burning wads and stuff like that falling down on their uniforms. <laughs> and if you spilled any, you know, uh, uh, your powder on the ground while you were loading, now suddenly you've set fire to, um, you know, the, the grass and whatever else is nearby. If, and it's just, it sounds like it would have been a hellacious place to be. So, all right, I think we're back on. on so uh, back then in game terms, we're going we're gonna to see... Um, uh, uh, there's an answer from from Mitch Guthrie that covers this. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in game terms, we're going to look in the next slide, and we'll see exactly how the artillery can be used, given that it's not generally permitted to fire over its own units other than the helicopter. So how do you use it effectively in a game? If we can go to the next slide, we'll see. Sure. Here we go. Okay. So this is an example of an ILAO battle that uh, we played this February. Uh, and you can see, uh, this is just a look at the at the um, game board multiple turns in, and you can see a Russian army in a generally linear formation with kind of two linear wings, um, almost in a more 18th century approach, um, uh, in two linear wings with the infantry in lines and the cavalry. If you look on the left side here, there's a dragoon unit way out on the flank, it's definitely covering the flank there, classic sort of uh, 1700s deployment. Uh, and then on the right-hand side of the map, you can see what used to be a Russian linear wing that's now beginning to get pressured by a strong French force in a combined arms arrangement. So Eric, let's zoom in on the right-hand side and we can see actual use in the game of that general formation that we looked at before. So what you can see here very nicely is the Russians in their line up above, sort of along the road and just behind it. Uh, actually, yeah, with a bunch of infantry there. And you can see the French approaching across open ground in that combined arms divisional formation with the checkerboard of the battalion columns. Uh, this was the Battle of Eilau, which was fought in February of 1807, and it was uh, in deep snow, totally frozen. So it's, the artwork shows where the ponds were, uh, but it was all totally frozen over, and it's clear terrain in the game. Um, the slopes are useful to go up and down and for line of sight blocking and stuff. Uh, so you can see one French division over on the right. Um, which is part of Sewell's Corps. And you can see the cavalry, not just a couple of light hussars, but actually pretty massive cavalry units setting up in that mid to, to back distance 
to support. And you can see the infantry with those deployment intervals and the skirmishers out front. And then on the left, if you, if you slide a little bit, uh, slide this to the right so that the, there you go, just like that. You can see in the center, there's a two hex open channel. That's actually where the artillery will be firing. And then on the left, you can see a second division of the same corps um, also approaching the Russian line in that combined arms checkerboard. So the infantry battalions, the, the backbone of the formation are the interval or checkerboarded infantry battalions. And the skirmishers are out front to begin making contact, begin inflicting firepower hits. Uh, and, and protect against enemy movement. So that's what it looks like in the game. Now let's zoom out and then go to the next slide. And now we can see this commented, which is I think a helpful way to look at stuff. So let's zoom in and move to the upper left and look at that Russian linear wing to start with. So here what you see is a defensive deployment in a classic musketry line with a bunch of infantry battalions and their, you know, their flanks are fairly well protected. Uh, on one side, they've got a Dragoon regiment that's ready to help cover the flank. And on the left, they have a, a castle, a chateau. That, so their flanks are anchored, but they're very linear and very thin and very strung out. And the longer the formation gets, the trickier it gets for the cavalry to help uh, those battalions. And what you can see actually is that one section of the line is not even covered sufficiently by the reaction zone of that Dragoon Regiment. So by setting up in that long linear musketry formation, the infantry firepower is very good, but it begin, the formation begins to get stiff and it begins to lose its mutual support. So now if we move over to the right, Yep, let's let's go um, even further. There we go, good, yeah, and, and back just slightly. Okay, great. Now we can see what's going on. Uh, if you, Now the French here are approaching in that combined arms formation, and you can see the battalion checkerboard, you can see the skirmishers out front, and you can see the big heavy cavalry divisions. There are two Dragoon divisions deployed, intermeshed with the infantry just where they were in that historical diagram. So they're kind of mid back and they're ready and able to charge out. And what that has done is it has forced by threat, it has forced the Russian line over on this part of the battlefield to begin going massively into square. And if you look at the, at the upper section, you can see the Russian infantry battalions are all in square. If you look through the middle, they're all in square. And the other thing is, that was a this was the gameplay with command rules as they begin to go from lines and two hex lines and close contact with each other the that linear formation had been relying on unit to unit shoulder to shoulder contact for its command uh transfer and when they start to break up under pressure of cavalry or by bad luck somebody got disordered out a very long thin line begins to lose its coherence and lose its command capability so they begin to you know, stutter and falter in their response. Uh, so here comes, meanwhile, here comes the French combined arms approach and the cavalry is making the threat. If the battalions don't form square, the cavalry will charge them and have a good chance of routing them or meleeing them. If they do form square, if you look up uh, what's gonna happen next, um, this line uh, up front or, the, or in the, um, wing off to the right, it's about to be under firepower threat of squares getting threatened by firepower. So that's no fun either. And then uh, if you look at the central Russian line here, the skirmishers have engaged it, they're beginning to do hits. And the battalion columns are now well positioned in the next turn um, to step up and launch. After waiting one or two or three turns, after the line has started to take hits, then those heavy columns can come up and they can do their melee attacks against uh, reduced infantry. So what you're seeing here is instead of having infantry and cavalry next to each other, infantry all here, cavalry all here, on sections of the front, which is, as Eric said, a very classic 18th century, you've got an intermass using the interval. 
where the intervals let you route back out, but they let you bring cavalry forward, or they also let you bring heavy artillery forward. And what you see in the red channel there in the middle, it's a two hex wide channel where the core artillery commanded by Marshal Sewell has a, a five or six hex range at the center of the Russian formation. And at the same time as having that channel there, both the cavalry and the infantry zones of influence and reaction charge zones, they're close enough to the edges of the fire channel so that nobody can counterattack back up the fire channel. Yeah, basically you've got, you know, with all of this cavalry that's here, um, if the Russians tried to charge the guns, they're going to get intercepted by all of that cavalry. Plus they're going to be taking all kinds of fire hits from uh, uh, from all the infantry they have to pass in the process. So it does make it very challenging to to sort of crack that nut um, if you're trying to get at that stuff. So that's an, so this is an example. What you're seeing here is of most of a French corps, a two French corps coming forward. It's Sewell's infantry corps plus Murat's heavy cavalry corps. And they're all, by using that intermesh with the open intervals, uh, they're able to get three heavy cavalry divisions and the core artillery and two strong infantry divisions all interacting all together, all in mutual support. It's big trouble for the defender, big, big trouble. Uh, and in fact, what would happen over the next turn or two is the combined arms engine would basically roll right through that line. There are ways to try to um, fight against this type of approach, but it's very, very effective. Uh, and it's really fun to be able to uh, see that historical approach with the intermesh coming almost to life on a lava tag game. Let's see here. We've got some interesting comments. Jeff Anderson, they probably somewhat somewhere in the afterlife checking in on this chat. <laughs> oh, he must be referring to Marshal Ney and Marshal uh, and, and Napoleon. Well, they, they knew what they were doing. So the only the only thing that that it's hard for us to imitate in the game is your hemorrhoids are acting up and you can't ride your horse or, you know, in the case of a lot of the Russian commanders, your syphilis is acting up and you can't <laughs> you can't get on your horse or do whatever else there kind of stuff. So, um, you know, th those are some of the things that uh, that obviously it, it would have impeded. Uh, Marshal Ney and certainly Napoleon at Waterloo, which I think is what uh, what uh, one of the chaps was making a comment about earlier. So, so the, the question then is like, how can you take what is available from historical knowledge and begin to apply it? You know, this isn't trying to be exactly like history, but you can definitely see a lot of the historical approaches that you read about or see in those diagrams. You can actually see them coming through live in the game, which is really cool. Eric, if you zoom out, um, Yep. Did you want to go to the next slide or? Well, let's just, just for fun, let's um, uh, flip up and flip down, up and down a couple times. And you can see the empty game map and then you can see this, the other direction. Yeah. Um, okay. Here we go. Yeah. So you can see this is the game map and then here's with, with annotation and then go down. You can see the comments to, to explain what's going on. There's a question here to comment on cavalry and column and the extended line requirement. Uh, this is very interesting. That's from Mitch Guthrie. So um, in uh, in many editions of La Bataille, many rules versions, uh, in second edition, third edition, fifth edition, and premier, it usually makes sense to use your cavalry in a single hex column formation. That's usually the most efficient, simplest way to just handle them and move them. Um, so by and large, that's how it's done. This particular game here was played under the regs 30. It's a mechanical difference of how cavalry is used, not a tactical difference. Um, the uh, In the regs 30, because the mechanics are different, cavalry is typically used in a single hex line. So the Hussar regiments and the Dragoon and Cuirassier regiments in regs 30, you can, which is what this is, if you zoom, zoom in, Eric, you can see that the cavalry is actually deployed in line. Yeah. And the mechanical reason for that is that uh, in, in 
second, third, fifth, and premier editions, um, if you're in a line formation with cavalry, you're permitted to choose how wide you want to go. Um, uh, you can be in one hex or two hexes or four. It depends on how many increments you have. But column is just usually the most flexible. Every it, Lancers you'll often use in line because of the... Right, you uh, get a bonus for that. Um, in the Rex 30, the cavalry mechanics are a little... They're trying to be a little more realistic and, and mechanistic. So uh, if you put cavalry in column in the Rex 30, you have to put it in column of company. And you get a medium-sized regiment. It takes up a lot of space. It takes up many hexes. Uh, also when cavalry moves in lot so you, so rather than doing column of companies which takes up too much space you actually put it in a single hex line and the reason you use a single hex line not a two or three or four hex line which you can is actually cavalry when it moves in line has a movement penalty and it, it loses its x2 bonus in melee so so in regs 30 typically single hex line is the standard formation for cavalry and the others are special cases Right. And if you were playing Premier, you wouldn't want to put your heavy cavalry in line because there's a penalty on their melee. So usually in Premier or third edition or fifth edition, you're going to have your heavy cavalry in column. So that's a kind of a difference between the rule sets, uh, how they might, uh, you know, uh, in, encourage one type of formation or another just based on how the rules are. Um, we did have a good question back here regarding infantry skirmishers. Um, so no, the infantry skirmishers, somebody had said, uh, here we go, Jeremy had asked, are they a meat shield to soak up losses? Um, not really. Um, the infantry skirmishers are uh, actually, because they're sort of dispersed, they have a better fire defense. And as such, uh, they're harder to hit but they still have decent firepower themselves. So what they're doing is they are getting the occasional hit on the opponent. They're screening your infantry columns as they come forward um, from artillery fire and from musket fire until the moment you're ready to pull the trigger in and push forward with your, your main assault. Um, so really they're, they're, they're acting as a screen and, um, and they've got a better fire defense, and they're still able to have a decent uh, uh, ability to, to to ping away at um, at their opponents. So, they're a very very aggressive screen. Um, they have a somewhat of a shielding aspect, but they're but it's but it's really it's a very aggressive shielding aspect, which is historical. Yeah. You know. So yeah. now we can move, I think, to the next set of slides, sure. which is um, uh, a different battle. So that was that was an example of a, of a really well organized systematic combined arms attack by the French. Let's look at some combined arms examples by the British uh, and by the French. Um, this is a, a game of Waterloo or Mont Saint Jean that uh, Eric and I played. That's Eric's hand, I think, over there uh, yep. <laughs> uh, in the corner, um, <laughs> moving up the Highlanders to protect the Um And the British are over here on the right. The, the British are on the defensive here. Now, combined arms, in our view, is the use of any combination of different types of units. Uh, you know, it can be infantry, cavalry, and artillery. It can be different types of infantry, uh, and so on. Um, so one thing that the British have done really in a really interesting way in this scenario is they have uh, skirmishers with ordinary smoothbore muskets from most of the battalions, and they have a certain number of rifle companies who can mix in with the um, with the ordinary skirmishers, the smoothbore skirmishers, and then you end up adding rifle firepower, rifle effects into all the all the uh, firepower attacks that you're making, um, even though there aren't all that many rifles to go around. So you spread them through the whole formation, and you make your skirmisher screen even more aggressive. Yeah, and the and the typically with uh, Mont Saint Jean and Catrabra Labatai games. Um, and even with some of the other ones where, uh, like Lenny, where the, some of the uh, Russian, excuse me, Prussian um, Jaegers have rifles, is that for every hit, um, it forces a morale check as opposed to, you know, sometimes you might need a, uh, an even numbered hit or an odd numbered hit to trigger that. Um, if you got rifles involved, it's going to cause a morale check. And the name of the game is cause your opponent as many morale checks as you can. If, they, if they're if they making more morale checks than you are, there's a good chance things are going to go south for them. Um, and so that's why having those rifle units dispersed 
uh, forces or gives you an opportunity for more um, elements to trigger those morale checks. You basically hate put a rifle company every other skirmish stack, and then you have you're usually making attacks with two stacks at a time, so you're getting rifles in almost every fire, which is yeah. Yeah. Um, let's go to the, so this is the British. You can see that the British are using, they're on defense, but they're also using that type of interval uh, because it gives them a lot of flexibilities. This is combined arms use on the defense. So let's, uh, let's move to the next uh, slide. Now this is commentary about what we're seeing in the British defense. Uh, Eric, could you zoom in uh, yep. uh, here? So now what we're seeing is the British have a picket line which is a set of low quality infantry battalions out front. They're hidden behind a reverse slope, uh, which is historical as well and can use the, the water. So they're protected from artillery. Artillery can't see them or shoot at them. Uh, and they have a hex gap between them because they don't need to be in every hex. Your, their zones of control will block incoming units anyway. Uh, and you want that interval to give yourself flexibility to disorder to the rear or to bring up reinforcements or for your own artillery or cavalry to charge through. Then on the defense, there's three lines of that checkerboard, a pit line, a midline, a backup line, and a main fighting line at the back where the really heavy guards, battalions, and others are ready when they have to be. Um, and in all cases, you're trying to maintain those intervals so that you always have a place for your units to disorder, a panel to disorder through, and you have a lot of flexibility at the front. Right, and the, and the infantry that's here in the back line is deployed in column. So it can uh, move forward quickly if it needs to, um, and it could change into other formations if it needs to. Um, so this gives it the most flexibility um, there in the backfield. Um, and then a number of these other uh, units that are here, part of the picket line, are in square uh, because there's a fair amount of uh, French cavalry that's kind of positioned here uh, on the wings or supporting the, uh, the French uh, infantry that's coming up. Um, so it's kind of there as a, as a preventative measure, knowing that behind the reverse slope, it's not gonna have a lot of time uh, from a line of sight point of view to uh, make a, 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 a check to rule for forming square. Um, and because it's you know a bunch of British allied units, uh, Wellington doesn't care about them. <laughs> So they're they're kind of you know uh, speed bumps on the way to uh, to slow down the the, the the French as they come in to make their attack. Uh, if we um, roll upwards a little bit, we can look some at the French deployment. You can see that the French in this case were actually using a line type of a linear type, more linear type approach, and the French are in these very strong firepower based musketry lines, but they're slow. They're slow and they are not intermeshed, not really. It's much more section by section with an infantry segment of you know five or eight hexes followed by a cavalry segment of four or four or five hexes. That's much more like the 18th century type of approach. And in the in the zone ahead of the cavalry, they'll sweep anything, but they're not well coordinated with their own infantry. You know, and the infantry can shoot anything, but it's not well coordinated with its cavalry to force squares. So this type of thin order, it has its place but uh, it, it's actually not taking advantage of the intermeshing. And there was, of course, a big historical debate about, well, should um, you know, musket troops deploy in thin order or deep order? It's ordre mass or ordre profond. And this is a pretty classic example of it. The French are in ordre mass or thin, thin lines, and the British have chosen, this, in this case, to do ordre profond, which is, has a whole lot more depth to it. It doesn't have that maximized upfront musketry firepower, but it has a lot of depth and flexibility. Yeah. And typically, if you are playing any of the games that have the British involved, um, oftentimes they're using their their allies, for want of a better word, as a buffer uh, between themselves and the French. So we think about at the Battle of Albuera, um, it's very much that the French have to kind of fight their way through the Spanish army before they can get come to grips with the British. And by that point in time, they've taken um, hits and things like that. So here, um, you know, Brennan had deployed the, uh, the uh, allies in a way where that has to happen. And then he's got the British skirmishers out there um, to soften up and slow down 
um, the uh, the French as they start to make their attack. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Jeremy Harris had a question about cavalry. We looked quite a bit at cavalry in the Eilau example, and here's an example of cavalry on the defensive um, in the Waterloo example. So what we have here is uh, the French approaching that picket line and the British cavalry is in the mid, mid zone. It's kind of in between the, um, uh, the backup line and the guards line, but the cavalry is all lined up behind those open intervals. And what you see if you move down one more slide is sound the trumpets and launch the charge. So, so as the French approached in a linear formation, they approached the skirmish line that was slowing them down and hanging them up on rifle fire. And they approached the picket line that was delaying the infantry. Suddenly there became an opportunity for the British cavalry to counter charge en masse. And they all launched at once. And there was really quite a thunderbolt of the, um, uh, the British cavalry storming out through the intervals and it uh you know there was kind of the actual combat result was more or less of a trade of some british cavalry regiments lost in doing this in exchange for some cavalry french cavalry regiments also lost and uh, some french artillery but it delayed the attack by an hour to two hours by causing disorganization and so on and it was all enabled because the intervals were there to start with uh, the uh, the checkerboard gave the British formation this backbone, this open backbone that the cavalry could come out uh, intermeshed with. Right, and and so in our particular game that we played, I've uh, some of you might have had a chance to watch the after action report I posted a few weeks ago. Um, everything that was kind of happening historically on the uh, Allied uh, left wing in our game was happening on the Allied right wing. And so instead of it being, you know, uh, Ponsby's charge um, on the uh, on the Allied left, it was Uxbridge's charge on the Allied right. And so it was very interesting to see how things played out in a very interesting historical um, sequence, but just the, the reversal of where things actually took place historically. Um, it was kind of cool to see that. And of course, we have to tell everyone why we are showing the 66 uh, on that die rule, Brennan. It's because that's the worst British Hussar regiment and it had to, <laughs> to make a morale check to launch a charge. <laughs> Nobody expected it to do, but it was a 66 and off it went. Um, yeah. So here's some really good questions. When is it appropriate and advantageous to use a solid line of infantry? That's a really good question. The, the, the specific answer is not right away. Um, if you go all the way back, Eric, to um, the slide where we had the the basic French deployment next to the diagram. Yeah, this there. One here. Okay. Yeah. Right. So as that type of combined arms formation approaches the enemy, typically what you'll do is the skirmishers will engage for one turn, and if at the end of the first turn you see the skirmishers aren't doing very well or it's appropriate, like the skirmishers engage for one, maybe two turns, and then that first row of battalions in the checkerboard, then they're gonna decide, are they gonna launch a column assault and, th and go for melee against the people you were skirmishing, or do they need to deploy into line, move up and fight a heavy musketry duel? So um, you, it, it's typically advantageous and appropriate to bring up, to do the infantry line on the second or third turn of contact you generally want to be making your approach to contact in the column with cavalry supporting and skirmishers around first. You, you can do it in line, but but it's most advantageous when you're making that intentional choice to do it because musketry is the heavy musketry is needed. Right. Um, we got another question here from Eric. Are there national differences that affect their respective ability to use various combined arm tactics? or that make different tactics better for different national armies? And that's a great question, and that's something we're planning on tackling. Obviously, the different national armies are changing their own tactics as they get their butts handed to them by Napoleon. Um, and so if we think about the, um, you know, the Prussians in 1806, um, they're not fighting the same way in 1813, in 1815, 14 and 15. 
they have learned from their mistakes. They have learned from how the French are doing things and they start to adapt that. So um, depending on which time period which, that the battle is set, um, there's going to be some things that you're going to have to do because the rules stipulate that. Um, and then there's and there's other things where you have a chance to use stuff. But yes, there are national differences. Um, and uh, But after a while, everyone starts to have very similar style <laughs> as, uh, as they have learned from the French. And uh, I would say the national differences in, uh, you know, between like, what, the Prussians and the French in 1815 are not all that different. Um, the Austrians, probably similar uh, to the French at that point in time. The British are still, they're doing their own thing because um, they've got a, a different circumstances, um, not having as much cavalry and artillery available. Um, but a lot of the people that are on the continent are fighting very much like the French towards the later part of the wars. Did you have anything else you wanted to add in on that, Brennan? Yeah, it's a really good question. One of the most fun and most beautiful things about La Bataille is that the designers, uh, thank you again to Marshall Enterprises and, and Clash of Arms people, they've put into the, into the specifics of each game really very noticeable national differences, and there are lots of differences. You're always trying with any given army to use combined arms where you can, but the nationalized systems that you come up with are quite different from nation to nation. Uh, in, in the Waterloo example we were just looking at, the British have the rifles, which are used in a way that very few other groups can. Um, the French uh, are sort of that classic intermeshed approach. The Prussians in 1806, they're much more linear like uh, we were seeing in some of these uses. And so on. So it, it's really very interesting from an historical point of view to, to engage with the game and explore. Like, okay, now I'm playing the Austrians. What's that actually like? Right. Uh, there are also some very good um, short tactics guides by Marshall Enterprises um, about how to use the Prussians in 1815, how to use the Austrians, how to use the French cavalry. They're, they're on the Marshall Enterprises website. They're very interesting, uh, and very worth reading. Uh, there's yeah. a question from Jeremy Harris about how to order the reserves. Uh huh. That's that's grand tactics. So what we've been looking at here is the engagement zone where the fighting is happening. You know, combined arms, uh, depth, and checkerboard versus the more linear approach. The artillery with a big channel to shoot at, but that has to be protected. Like that's the that's the central fighting zone. And the question of where to bring up the reserves, that's the question that if you do it well, you will, that's your chance to win the game, you know, with a sweeping uh, blow um, kind of thing. Uh, and there's no one right answer. You want, that's where you got to do your thinking as the army commander. It's really fun. Um, right. But I mean, if we're looking at this particular example, uh, in this particular case, the French have got, um, almost all of their infantry is uniform quality. Um, now, if you're doing the same thing with the Prussians in 1813 through 1815, and you've got part of the, your, your division or part of your brigade includes Landwehr, and now that's a totally different story. Where do you put the Landwehr? Do you put them up front um, where they kind of soften things up a little bit? Um, but, you know, they're not very good quality. They're, they're militia. Or do you have them later further back so that once your better troops have, have inflicted a little damage, you send them in like a torpedo uh, or like a like a battering ram to kind of punch through the French. Um, so there's we'll talk about some of those different things that are done. But in this particular example with this French division, um, I think if you're talking about where, where you have your troops, um, all of the French are, uh, in that particular division are all fairly good quality. Um, but you want to have things mutually supporting. So you don't want your reserves so far back that they can't get up in time to uh, plug a hole or to support a unit that might be getting surrounded or something like that. So having these, these gaps between them allows them for that mutual support um, when it comes to uh, dealing with a calamity on the battlefield where somebody you know disorders away um, unexpectedly. Not sure if that answers your question, Jeremy, but um, that's that's our best for the moment. <laughs> were there, were a, any other questions you came across there? We want to. There, there's uh, a one about what's the best use of cavalry in a large infantry confrontation, frontal or from the side. 
That's very interesting. I mean, the, the quick answer to that is that as an engagement is beginning between large groups, you have a division with some support or a core on both sides coming up for an infantry confrontation. You usually want some cavalry mixed in, intermeshed with it in a structured way, not just like randomly, but for example, that's actually historically why a French Corps would have a light cavalry brigade associated with it, because they would, if you basically want them just, just behind or sometimes out in front of the, um, uh, of the infantry as it approaches, either to frighten away the defending skirmish line or just behind to react to a cavalry countercharge. And then once the large infantry forces have gotten engaged in a heavy duty infantry match, a fun thing to do is to bring up a whole division or a whole corps of heavy cavalry on the flank and line it up for one of those grand charge massive and right. you know, have, it, have it go horizontally across rolling up the flank. That's a real art form. Um, so I think the answer to that, the best use of cavalry is in the early movement to contact is in an intermatch light touch way. And then later tending to fade to the side, looking for the heavy, heavy Mike Tyson kind of hook. I guess. Right. And normally if you take a look at how the, the uh, units are set up on the order of battle chart, particularly with the French, um, you know, the Napoleon has a reserve of cavalry. So he's normally holding back his heavy cavalry um, and he doesn't have it sort of scattered higgly piggly. The light cavalry of the core um, and, and some of the reserve, they tend to be spread out a little bit more along the line. And then that heavy cavalry, he's holding it back for that moment when a moment of decision, um, either to bail out, you know, something disastrous that is, that's happening. Uh, if we think about the, the big charge at Eilau, um, or, you know, to, to punch through um, the opponent and, and tip things over in your, in your favor um, there once, once things are softened up with their infantry and there's that moment. Um, so just looking at how the armies are structured gives you some idea of how you could be thinking about what to do with your, with your troops and with your, uh, uh, particularly your cavalry. Another very important thing to note about cavalry, Eric, if you... Um... Move down two slides. Sure. Um, the the really excellent starting position for especially for the heavy cavalry is on the left and right wings of your main artillery batteries. The one thing you're trying to do, you want to do all the way through your lava attack is preserve the artillery as long as possible. And a really good way to do that um, is to have very strong heavy cavalry units on the left and right wings of the main batteries so that no matter who tries to charge the guns, you're going to intercept them uh, and maybe stomp all over them. So so what you see here in this uh, approach is the heavy cavalry. It, it's close enough to the front to have some forward threatening pressure, but it's actually its main job as currently deployed here. It's actually to protect the left and right sides of the artillery battery. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can do that for hours. The heavy cavalry can just sit left and right of the main batteries for an hour or three hours or four hours, giving the artillery a chance to do it. And then it cuts loose with uh, entering into the uh, front line. Right. And then typically, particularly with, you know, the French, they have so many fantastic, you know, leaders with great uh, 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 artillery bonuses. Um, or special leaders. So they're able to really coordinate a lot and you can inflict a lot of damage over the course of uh, a couple of turns. Um, and then and then you're ready, you've got a gap ready to exploit either with the cavalry or with your infantry. So if we, well, we, 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 we are, we are at um, an hour and 15 minutes, Brennan. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably time to wrap up. If there are any particular questions, you know, definitely pop them up there. Uh, I thanks everybody for listening, Eric. Thanks for setting this up. It's been uh, hopefully interesting, you know, to to everybody to see some of those authentic historical roots, and then to look at how to try to apply those those ideas um, in a fun and effective way on the on the Labatite game map. Yeah, I, we actually got through all the slides. So I thought, oh, we still had one more left, but we're, we're doing okay. Um, any other questions that you folks have, uh, feel free to post them there. I'll take a look here real quick and see if we missed anything. 
Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. All right. Uh, Meandering Mike was asking, which are the top three Knopf Singer books that you would recommend? I think the top three books I would recommend would be John Keegan's The Face of Battle, um, uh, John Elting's Swords Around a Throne. Yep, that's my number one. <laughs> and then Imperial Bayonets. Those are pro those are probably uh, the top. Three. They're in the reference list in the guide at the back of the guide. There are um, uh, there's a set of cool, cool references. So those are some really good ones. Right. Let's see. Um, let's see. What have we got? I have to wear any others. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, I forgot to tell you the game. It was the day at Waterloo. I'm not sure what this is. It's a smaller version of a larger La Bataille game. I believe it's brigade level. Yeah, so uh, that's one that uh, Ed Wimble had put out, I think. Um, if I'm thinking of the same thing, um, that came out, oh gosh, I, at least I got a copy of it back in 2019. Um, so that's not a bad little game, too. Let's see here. Let's see. All right, we've got fantastic show. Thanks so much, everyone. Great questions. Good, good, good. Um, great stuff. Obviously, they're interested. Okay. <laughs> and let's see. Texagander says, reading Etling now. Very large uh, volume, yes. So he's got really good stuff. Um, and it was very interesting. Uh, I was talking with Ed Wimble a while back, and he had mentioned that he actually had uh, correspondence with uh, Etling uh, for quite a bit. So he's got copies of letters that two of them exchanged back, I guess it would have been back in the 70s, um, talking about a lot of this stuff. So if you guys ever have a chance to meet Ed Wimble, I'm going to see if I can get him on one day. He's a little camera shy. Um, but uh, he is just so full of, of knowledge on, you know, all things Napoleonic and this time period. And he's got stories about, you know, some, some random thing out of the blue. He'll talk about his stuff. And it's, it's really cool to just uh, listen to him talk about uh, the different games and, and particularly the different historical stuff that's going on. So, well, good. Um, I think that's, that's kind of it. Let's see. We've got... Uh, couple more people saying thanks and uh gonna watch later yep you can watch this later and let's see it looks like here uh, nangawa is saying a osprey book french infantry tactics um yeah uh some of the different osprey stuff i've seen a few um they're kind of nice they're colorful books um and they'll have some good things in those too so um it's certainly a little easier to digest than some of the other heavy tomes that uh, that Brennan and I are referring to that will take you quite a bit of time to read through, but are well worth well worth it. Okay, well, terrific. I think we covered a whole lot. Brennan, uh, this was fantastic. I I hope you had fun. I know I certainly had a good time. And oh, super gonna, fun, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks and for going to try it up. And thanks to everybody for participating. It really felt like a conversation. Uh, uh, about this and I hope everybody has a lot of fun playing and we can all play on Vassal or, or in person. When yeah, and if you guys are interested in seeing um, how Brennan puts things into action, um, we're involved in a six player game on Vassal uh, on Monday nights. It is the Battle of Austerlitz and Brennan has the Allied Center. Um, I've got the French Center, so I'm expecting to get completely destroyed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, to, uh, to, you know, keep Napoleon at least from not getting captured. <laughs> and so, yeah, you guys can tune in and watch that. Um, it's kind of fun to see uh, how that works. And uh, we'll be doing some more stuff here. I think Brennan and I are planning on trying to get together maybe twice a month um, to do these little presentations for everybody. And, um, and yeah, as I said, if you guys have any questions or comments or suggestions on topics, by all means, make those in the YouTube space below, and then I can look at them in the future, and um, and then we can get it all set. So without any further ado, we're going to say farewell to everybody. Uh, Brandon, thanks for hanging out tonight, and uh, and I'll see you on Monday at You're across Monday. The, the chilly fields of Austerlitz. Um, and everybody else, have a great day and a great weekend. Uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Be well. Bye-bye.